Senator Warner, Secretary Burke, Phyllis, uh, thanks to all of you for including me on this panel. It's a great privilege to be up here with my senior colleagues and to talk about this very important topic. Sorry, though, I will have to begin by taking exception to one of your comments about rock stars. <laughs> Uh, my summertime reading was the autobiography of Keith Richards. Uh, it was really scary, and I'm sure that nobody in this room is even close to that lifestyle. <laughs> Different, rock Different type of rock star. So, um, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the Pew Charitable Trust really let me down because they wouldn't let me use PowerPoint. The Army's all about PowerPoint. So, I am going to use a visual aid. I'm going to start a little bit giving a, a policy foundation for what the Army does. And then two sort of practical examples, one at the very tactical edge of the Army and one at one of our major installations to highlight how we're trying to put into effect the strategy. So earlier this summer, we published this document, the Energy Security and Sustainability Strategy for the United States Army. It's on the website, and I'd encourage you to, to take a read through particularly given that we're here in one of the premier think tanks and study organizations in the city. And I'm going to use the document for, for my talking points, but its, its purpose is to develop a strategic roadmap to foster a more adaptable and resilient force that is prepared for the f a future defined by complexity and change. All right. It establishes security, resiliency, and future choice as the organizing principles around the Army energy strategy. And it looks at a ready force, secure resources, and resilient capabilities. These are all attributes that we feel are important to our mission success. Notice there's nothing in there about legislation, sorry, Senator, or executive orders, or one of the 163 energy mandates that are currently on the books. It's about our mission and how we could develop a policy and a strategy foundation to achieve that mission. It has five goals. The first one was very important. It's informed decisions. And this is about the human, the human capital factor. Every, the services are huge, and everybody in that service, from a private to a general, makes a decision that affects our energy. The private might throw out a battery. The general might say, I want four feedings a day, gyms and, uh, and movie theaters in the field. Both of those have impacts on our energy demand. So we're really going to focus on the human dimension. We're going to talk about optimizing use, not conserving, not, not, not eliminating, but optimizing. Uh, we want assured access, which is critical. This notion of resiliency. So I came to the department from Department of Energy where I talked about energy efficiency and insulation and building envelopes and solar panels. As I focused on the Army, it, it really is about resiliency and there's this tremendous connection between energy security and cyber security that I think that we have not yet fully played out to the extent that it's important. And then we conclude as our fifth goal, which is to drive innovation. And if uh, Secretary Burke has probably read this part a couple times, we paid her a high compliment. We basically plagiarized this, copied it word for word from the first operational energy strategy that was written during her tenure. So the storyline, the two sort of vignettes I want to talk about is how we're applying this is in the tactical edge of the battlefield, combat outpost gyro. <clears throat> so as the Army's withdrawing from Afghanistan, all the equipment is coming out except for one set of equipment which was flowing in. That was energy. We were moving new generators, new microgrids, solar panels, tents, and LED lighting against the, the stream of all the goods that were coming out. One of the reasons with an outpost like Outpost Gyro, <coughs> infantry platoon with some assets, Afghan counterparts, road resupply every single time we sent a convoy down the road, we took a casualty. We had 100% casualties on our road resupply. So we transferred to aerial resupply. We were dropping in fuel five times a month. By deploying tents and lights and generators and microgrids and renewables, we dropped that fuel drop. We dropped that from five to two resupplies a month. That, mean, that meant that you got three extra days of infantry platoon time, three extra days of gunship time, three extra days of helicopter, and uh, C-130 time so that those assets could go do other things like fight and kill the Taliban. So that's what we did at the tactical edge. Now multiply that up across the entire Army. We want to build that flexibility, that decision-making, that resiliency. Um, 
Schofield Barracks Hawaii. It's our largest installation in the Pacific. It's a platform of power, a power projection. And we are working in a third party arrangement with the local utility where we are going to give HECO land to put a tri-fuel power plant. Now a couple of interesting things here. In Hawaii, all your baseload power is produced on the shore. It's on the shoreline. A tsunami comes through, it will take out the baseload power. All right. We're offering them a power gener baseload power at 900 feet altitude, and it will have the ability to burn natural gas, if that's permitted. Right now, uh, the governor said it won't be permitted. Heavy fuel oil, which is a standard oil, fuel oil in Hawaii and readily available, as well as biodiesel or biofuels. So we have that redundancy of fuel sources. We have a renewable component. And in return for this siting and the plant, the utility is going to build a microgrid that connects all of Schofield Barracks with the Army Airfield and a civilian hospital, which is right outside the perimeter of the installation. So we will have a platform of resiliency with redundant fuel sources at a high altitude, capable of not only meeting renewable energy goals, but also providing security both for the Army and for, for the island of Hawaii or island of Oahu in the state of Hawaii. So anyway, those are two examples. That's the policy construct. And I look forward to taking your questions on any of the details that you might have from electric vehicles and soldier batteries to PV panels in Georgia. Thank you very much.